Hello, I'm Nuala McGovern with BBC World News. Our top stories. Britain's Prime Minister says those responsible for the murder of the aid worker David Haynes will be hunted down and brought to justice. Now, David has been murdered in the most callous and brutal way imaginable by an organisation which is the embodiment of evil. North Korea sentences an American to six years hard labour, saying he was planning hostile acts against the country. Thousands remain trapped by floodwaters, but rescue efforts in northern India are disrupted by more bad weather. And with just four days of campaigning left before the Scottish independence referendum, both sides reach out to undecided voters. The British Prime Minister has vowed to hunt down and bring to justice those responsible for the death of the aid worker David Haynes. Islamic State militants released a video late on Saturday which appears to show Mr Haynes being beheaded by a masked man. The 44-year-old was kidnapped in Syria 18 months ago. This report from our correspondent Caroline Hawley does not show any moving pictures from the video but it does contain a still image which you may find distressing. His family had only just appealed to his kidnappers to make contact. Hours later came their chilling response. The video is similar to those posted after the murders of two American journalists, but addressed this time to America's allies. And it includes a threat to kill another British hostage. The captor appears to be the same man with a British accent seen in the previous videos. He blames Britain's decision to help arm Kurdish fighters. This British man has to pay the price for your promise, Cameron, to arm the Peshmerga against the Islamic State. David Cameron emerged after a meeting of the government's emergency committee. His resolve apparently only strengthened by what he called an unspeakable act. David Haynes was a British hero. The fact that an aid worker was taken, held and brutally murdered at the hands of ISIL sums up what this organisation stands for. They are killing and slaughtering thousands of people, Muslims, Christians, minorities across Iraq and Syria. They boast of their brutality. They claim to do this in the name of Islam. That is nonsense. Islam is a religion of peace. They are not Muslims, they are monsters. This was David Haynes in Croatia. Filmed in 2003, he spoke of helping people return to homes they'd abandoned during the war of the 1990s. There are many people that do want to return, but they just don't know how and don't know who to turn to. In doing this, the, our office normally goes across to Belgrade and actually meets the people so they can gain trust from us. Colleagues of David Haynes say he was passionate about what he was doing, work that was to take him to some of the most dangerous places in the world, from here in the Balkans to Africa and the Middle East. When he was captured in March last year, he was helping supply tents, food and water for refugees in northern Syria. Paying tribute to him, his brother Mike said, he helped whoever needed help, regardless of race, creed or religion. David was most alive and enthusiastic in his humanitarian roles. After James Foley and Stephen Sotloff, David Haynes is the third Western hostage to be killed since American airstrikes against the so-called Islamic State began last month. As the government and its allies prepare their response, David Haynes's family said he would be missed terribly. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, with me now is our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. Frank, it's a grim pattern that we have seen over the past few weeks, at first with James Foley, then Stephen Sotloff, and now David Haynes. And also, in that video, they threatened another life. Yeah. What do you think the response might be from the British government? Will it change anything? Well, I think we've already seen the first bit of the response, which is a very impassioned and quite angry speech by David Cameron today, uh, followed and, and matched by condemnation from leaders, particularly Muslim leaders here in Britain, who absolutely deplore these actions, saying that this is totally un-Islamic and that they have no right to call themselves Islamic State, etc. What the British government has done is to have a crisis meeting today. They are, to be honest, fairly impotent, fairly powerless to protect the very small number of Western hostages that are being held by this group, probably in Syria, probably in or around the, the town of Raqqa, 
because they tried a hostage rescue back in July. They got the right place in the wrong time. They waited so long to do it uh, that when they got there to this oil facility, they found evidence that the hostages had been held there, but they'd been moved. They will have been dispersed now, probably being held underground somewhere. Very difficult to find out where they are. And even if they could find them, they'd probably have to shoot their way through a number of civilians who would be around there. So it's not an easy option for them to do, even if they knew where they were. So essentially, David Cameron and the British government is left with three options. One, do what the, what Islamic State, so-called Islamic State, are demanding, which is to withdraw completely from the conflict against them. He's already ruled that out, mm -hmm. um, as has Obama, President Obama. Two, carry on doing what they're doing, supplying arms and ammunition and training to the Kurdish Peshmerga uh, and a bit of intelligence cooperation. Three, step it up a bit, and I think that's what we're going to see. That doesn't necessarily mean Royal Air Force airstrikes. It doesn't necessarily mean military action. It means increasing their cooperation with countries in the region, places like Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, to come up with some kind of across-the-board strategy to defeat um, this group, both ideologically as well as politically. It's um, a very specific, perhaps unique story that you have these geopolitical arguments like we saw the statement with David Cameron earlier, but then you have these heartfelt pleas from families and it's their loved one that they are trying to save. We saw it with David Haynes. Perhaps we'll also see it with the next British hostage. Well, I'm not going to speculate about that, but I mean, you're right that the videos do follow a very familiar pattern. It's a tried and tested pattern of very slickly produced videos filmed from two different angles, at least two angles, involving several people. We only see one militant, but clearly there is a script that has been put in front of the hostage and he's, he's made to recite that. And then at the end, another hostage is produced and, you know, and a threat, etc. Et this is essentially what you could call asymmetric warfare. It's where a one group that is weaker than another, although Islamic State, so-called Islamic State, have been very powerful in the region that they have controlled, they're no match for the US Air Force. They can't, they, they, they can't reply to US airstrikes um, around Haditha and the Mosul Dam by shooting them down. They'd love to, but they don't have the capability. So instead, this is a way of getting back at the West through the medium of public opinion and information. Frank Gardner, thank you very much. And you can follow Frank on Twitter for more updates on this story. A court in North Korea has sentenced an American man to six years hard labour for what it says were hostile acts against the government. Matthew Miller stood trial five months ago after he entered the country as a tourist. He was accused after his arrest of tearing up his visa. But notes produced in the court suggest he may have been involved with WikiLeaks. Steve Evans reports from Seoul. Matthew Miller, 24 years old, from California, now is set to spend six years in a North Korean hard labor camp. Before the court, his American passport, the visa he was accused of ripping up, and an intriguing set of notes. If he wrote them, he says he was seeking asylum to avoid imprisonment because of his involvement in WikiLeaks. My agenda, he says, is to remove the American military from South Korea. The outside media weren't allowed into that trial, so it's impossible to know what weight to put on those notes. But here in South Korea, there is much questioning. Were the notes written under duress? Was he really involved with WikiLeaks, fearing imprisonment back in the West? Mr. Miller's arrest in April was announced just as President Obama landed in South Korea. In the past, North Korea's released prisoners after Presidents Carter and Clinton visited Pyongyang. North Korea is isolated because of its military build-up and its development of nuclear weapons. Matthew Miller finds himself a small figure who's entered that highly dangerous confrontation. Stephen Evans, BBC News, Seoul. And that is Steve Evans uh, reporting for us from Berlin. Well, uh, let's move on now to another story, which is the rescue efforts uh, following the floods which have affected parts of northern India and Pakistan. They've been disrupted by more rainfall. Hundreds of thousands of people remain trapped by floodwaters, with Srinagar in Indian-administered Kashmir particularly badly hit. India's Air Force has suspended operations to rescue survivors until the rain clears.